the Surgeon's Log 2021, Case Archives of the Skull Base and Beyond, a webinar presented by the North American Skull Base Society in association with Global Brain Surgery Initiative. I'm your host, Dr. Walter Jean. If you've enjoyed this and other episodes, don't forget to click the subscribe button on our YouTube channel so that you don't miss any future episodes. For now, let's get ready for yet another exciting and entertaining episode of Surgeon's Law 2021. Episode 2, our presenting surgeons are Dr. Jeffrey Kim, Professor of Otolaryngology from Georgetown, uh, and his uh, uh, neurosurgical partner, uh, Dr. Russell Lonzer, who is Professor Chair of Department of Neurosurgery at the Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, they are uh, partners, uh, they were partners at the National Institute of Health. Uh, you see a picture there in Bethesda, uh, a pride and joy of the United States uh, of healthcare research. And they were longtime partners there when Dr. Lonzer, um, well, we actually all started our careers in Washington, D.C. together almost. And Dr. Lonzer, of course, was chair uh, at the NIH um, before he went to Ohio State. Uh, Dr. Kim is also my personal partner in otology. I love this picture absolutely passionately. Uh, this is, you know, the Americans are into stock car racing and Europeans are into Formula One racing. Uh, Dr. Kim is the single best backseat driver on the planet. You can see that I'm doing a retrosigmoid approach for an acoustic here. And there's Dr. Kim telling me, uh, you're doing this wrong, you're doing that wrong, you're doing that wrong. Uh, when we were all uh, working in Panama here on a mission. Um, our guest of honor, uh, is a legend in skull base surgery. Professor Mauro Sana is founder and director of Grupo Otologico uh, in Roma and uh, Piacenza in, in uh, Italy. Uh, he is, of course, a giant in the field. He is a founding member of the European Skull Base Society and the Italian Skull Base Society and honorary members of several European Otological Society as well. Uh, and, you know, some of us, namely me, uh, have one book in Tima. Uh, there are actually too many books uh, to list here for uh, Professor Sana. This is only an excerpt of his uh, 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 books on, on Tima. And uh, of course, he is, again, a giant in the field that needs no further introduction. Um, the format of this uh, webinar, of course, starts with uh, the hot seat. Uh, and on the hot seat today is Dr. Uh, Scott Shapiro, who is uh, a fellow otology at the University of Cincinnati in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, the format starts with uh, me presenting the case to Dr. Shapiro, uh, him working through the decision making and approach decisions for the case. And then uh, Dr. Kim, Drs. Kim and Lonzer will then uh, talk. Uh, about how they approach the ca uh, case. And of course, then Professor Sana will be the uh, discussant at the end and use the podium as he sees fit. Um, all right, so let's get started. Uh, the episode we're calling the Christocrat from Göttingen. So Scott, this is a 29 year old woman with a gradual right sided hearing loss and also a gradual uh, right facial weakness. Uh, and by the time uh, she presented to Drs. Kim and Lonzer, she had a House Brackman four out of six uh, on the right side. Uh, her past medical history is uh, quite interesting. Nine years ago, she had one week of vertigo and dizziness that uh, put her in the hospital. Uh, she is blind in the right eye. She has cranial uh, spinal hemangioblastomas. She also has a pancreatic cyst and surgical history shows that she has had bilateral adrenonectomies. So uh, for the younger sect in the uh, audience, Scott, what is this uh, disease process? Um, I think if you want me to go out and say what, what syndrome I'm suspicious for, if yeah. I understand, um, with, with the multiple uh, neoplasms we're suspicious here is von Hippel-Lindau, most likely. Great. So, so uh, the aristocrat from Göttingen, of course, is uh, von Hippel. So that's, that's the name of the episode. So on examination, her eyes move normally. She has a right facial palsy as described in the history of House Brackman 6 with incomplete eye closure and no forehead movement. Her motor exam is fine. Her light touch sensation is normal. And on audiogram, there is, um, actually, I think I, I flipped this. I think the, the uh, right ear is the profound sensory neuro hearing loss and the left ear is normal. So everything is on the right side. Okay. 
Here are uh, her pictures uh, on presentation to you. I'm going to let you uh, a, a one like a couple of seconds to take a look at these. The left-hand column is without gadolinium, and the right column is with gadolinium. And okay. uh, so I like at, your thought. I sure. like your thoughts. So we're we're looking at several axial slices of a T1 non T1 weighted MRI, non contrast on the left, contrast on the right. Um, what we're we're seeing is essentially looks like a kind of heterogeneous on T1 non-contrast uh, soft uh, mass at the, about the level of the kind of the posterior petrous face, it looks like. Um, and it looks like it's it's avidly taking up quite a bit of contrast. Um, it does look like as we go lower to uh, start getting towards the towards the jugular bulb and um, in that region, it looks, um, um, it looks like a kind of a heterogeneous uptake of contrast as well, but it does take up quite a bit. Where, where do you think this, the, the center of this lesion is? Is it, is it uh, you know, intracranial, extracranial in the, where, where, where would you describe the, the center of this, of this thing? Um, it's a little bit small, but I think just post, just the posterior aspect of, of, of the labyrinth, most likely, I mean, based on the syndrome would be my suspicion, but there's, looks like a fair bit of jugular, it's a fair bit of jugular bulb involvement as well. Um, okay. and if, if I didn't and, have her syndromic features, I'd be suspicious for, for something like a paraganglioma instead. So, so, okay. So, but with the syndrome, you're not suspicious of the paraganglioma. I, 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 st I still am, but, um, you're but still, think, okay. So that's in on the differential, but lower down. Uh, okay, what's, uh, let's see, what do, what do you think about these? Okay, we're looking at uh, axial bone window uh, CT scan slices uh, of the right temporal bone. And here you see a lot of um, sort of erosion or lytic changes on the right Petra's face. This, especially the, the middle and right slices, really should seem like it's centered on uh, around the, the posterior aspect of the labyrinth and um, and and endolymphatic sac. So I do think it is probably centered there. Although on the, oh. the left, it, it gets pretty low, um, on, uh, on the, on our, our high as well. Um, it looks like there's some intracranial involvement as well. Um, I think it's uh, centered, so what, like center on the posterior picture's face now that I'm looking at it, yeah. So you already mentioned, uh, you mentioned the, the magic word. Uh, so what is this? Uh, I think this is a really, really rare, but given our Hirsch syndromic features in the, this location, this is, I think this is an endolymphatic sac tumor. And so what would you do next? Um, uh, they're, these are benign, but pretty locally aggressive. Um, I, I, patient already has a grade six weakness, sensorial hearing loss, bound dysfunction. I, I think this might, I probably recommend surgery for this patient pending. Well, let, let, let's pull back just a second. Here. Okay. You're not, quite re you're not quite ready to do that yet. Uh, audio, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, audiogram. Um, we're going to, we're going to do a hearing test first, of course. Um, okay. The hearing test already done right side, at, uh, severe sensory hearing, uh, neural hearing loss and the left side is normal. Any other diagnostic tests that you will require? Um, I'd probably get, um, uh, some, so she's, it sounds like she's had some workup, but potentially genetic testing, abdominal, probably abdominal imaging as well. Um, okay. Um, okay. So lo looking back at the MRI scan here, uh, you know, as, as, as a neurosurgeon, I, I'm very worried that, that there's such an uptake of the gadolinium and, and such an appearance, almost like, you know, for neurosurgeons, it looks like an ABM. So anything else that you want to do before you? Um, I would probably get, uh, or some, uh, uh, an angiogram. I'd probably even just, uh, uh, I'll let myself get some, probably even send some serum metanephrines, urine metanephrines, uh, as well. Okay. So what, what your thoughts on this uh, picture? Um, it looks like there's a blush of contrast, uh, from, this is an angiogram of the cerebrovasculature of the head and neck. And it looks like there's a bus of contrast. I think that is um, ascending pharyngeal mostly that's supplying this. Okay. And, and th how this impacts on your management, we will we'll discuss in a second. Uh, let's move forward. Now, uh, we always go with the anatomical and therapeutic considerations next. When you're looking at these pictures, Scott, 
tell the younger uh, audience in the in the uh, uh, tell the younger folks in the audience what your eye is drawn to as you formulate the treatment goals and uh, formulate your approach uh, decisions? Uh, sure. So um, I look at um, essentially what surgical corridor, if we're talking about surgery for this patient, um, this lesion can be accessed. So I, I first say, okay, there's, uh, um, it's in the, the, uh, the middle ear, labyrinth, posterior petrous face. And so, um, and, and then I think, so what, what approaches are going to get me access to that region? I'm suspicious for, um, for the possibility of, uh, of an inter, some intracranial involvement doesn't clearly, I can't tell if it clearly shows it on the MRI, but it's certainly close. Um, and then um, I'm also looking at the, uh, mainly the, the carotid, um, can it be cleared? But I think the status of the labyrinth is, is important for one um, and, they, uh, and the intracranial com compartment. And uh, what, what, finally, why is this relation, what, why is the relationship with the labyrinth important to you? Um, I think if it is not, if it's uh, sort of stayed out of the labyrinth and not invaded, um, there's the potential, especially in someone with, with von Himmel limbaugh who may get it on the, get one on the other side later, there's the potential for, I say potential for hearing, for preserving hearing with surgery. Um, if, and so I might be less likely to consider um, um, a, a, an approach that goes through the labyrinth that takes, that guarantees okay. the hearing loss. In, in addition to the labyrinth, is there another structure with the relationship of which between that and it will influence your decision? The carotid here. Okay, the carotid. Anything else? Um, we mentioned uh, intradural, um, uh, anteriorly, uh, glenoid fossa, it looks clear. Um, facial, facial nerve as, uh, as well, although it's going to be all through the facial nerve and... Uh, um, Okay. Think think about think about the hearing mechanism as we move forward. Okay. So let, let's talk about the goal of treatment now. Uh, there, there's always the the goal of not treating, right? If something is just better left alone. So what are our goal of treatments here? And, and I'll give you some a couple of questions to guide you guide you on all the, on this discussion. Do you think the hearing is reversible? Uh, I don't think the hearing loss is reversible. I think what is there. I have you know we haven't seen an audiogram, but what what is there could be preserved. The more, more, the more hearing loss there is, the less likely that's going to happen, I think. Okay. So treatment goal is not to reverse the hearing loss then. Um, is the facial, fun facial nerve function reversible? Um, potentially uh, with, with grafting, I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't promise if removing the, fa removing the tumor from the facial nerve I don't, is not going to necessarily allow, necessarily allow for recovery. Although that, there's a, um, I, I would say uh, depending on, uh, in general, these can be dissected from the facial nerve, but with pre-existing facial nerve weakness, I think the, the chance of recovery of the facial nerve, especially over a six-month time frame, is very unlikely. So is there any reason for treatment then? Is there an oncological reason for treatment? Um, these generally uh, can be locally aggressive and, gr and grow, and so I think that um, intracranial complications um, and, uh, and essentially um, for further cranial neuropathies, um, for those reasons, I would, I, I think. So, so it sounds like you're in favor of surgery. So what is the goal for surgery then? Um, as, as the safest resection, safest resection possible. Um, I, again, I haven't seen the extent of the hearing loss, but um, potentially with hearing preservation, potentially not. And then I would say, um, depending on the status and how how easily it, the facial nerve could be dissected, you could, you could essentially graft the facial nerve at the time, or I would probably, depending, uh, or, and resect it in, in continuity, or but for, you know, locally aggressive benign tumor, I would probably try to dissect it from, from facial without, uh, and leaving the nerve in continuity. But the main goal of surgery, it sounds like you, you want to really control this so that it doesn't get bigger to, you're preventing further future problems from happening. Is that what, is that correct? Am I putting words yeah. in your mouth? Yes. Okay. All right. So you want a maximum safe resection to prevent future deteriorations. Okay, so the $50,000 question, what are the options here for approach? Um, again, I haven't seen her uh, the, the extent of the hearing test, but if, if a hearing preservation uh, approach was to be considered, um, what- All right, let me stop you there, Dr. Kim. Dr. Yeah. Kim, uh, you, you did not show us the audiogram here, which is a little bit surprising, but can you describe the audiogram for us, Dr. Kim? 
Yeah, she, uh, as you could tell, she has extensive tumor on the right side. So she had a profound sensory hearing loss on the right side. She had no hearing whatsoever. Okay. Uh, and she lost it like maybe nine years ago when she had an episode of vertigo. And the left side was perfectly normal. Okay. Um, so in that case, I would not consider a hearing preservation approach like a retro labyrinthine approach, for example. Um, I think in, in this situation, um, I would consider a, uh, a trans labyrinthine approach to, for resection. I also am concerned about that degree of uh, abutting um, the carotid there. Um, and I think um, that uh, that anterior exposure may be, uh, you may be limited with the trans lab approach and you may consider something like a trans otic or in a patient who's already has facial nervous function, a trans cochlear, where you really either, either reroute the facial nerve. Um, and then all of those, if, if you encounter it, would allow for, for a um, uh, entering the posterior fossa if needed as well. So. All right, so question, what are you gonna do? I think I do a trans otic approach in this patient um, and uh, deter depending on what I find regarding the facial nerve at the time um, would would then would then uh, either again if I find gross in involvement um, such that I'm worried about the amount of disease left behind and again these are locally aggressive typically shouldn't invade the facial but if the patient already has grade six dysfunction um, but I'd probably try to dis leave, leave the facial in the, in the canal and dissect the tumor off of it um, uh, okay. So to, so to summarize for the audience again, who are all uh, young trainees thinking through how they would approach it, uh, you verbalize very well what, what I think they're all thinking. So your, the goal of treatment for you is maximum safe resection to prevent future, future problems. And your uh, approach of choice is a transotic approach. Uh, that's correct, yes. Excellent. So great job, Scott. You get to sit back now and enjoy your coffee. Doctors Lonzer and Kim are up now, and they will tell us how they thought about this uh, patient, how they strategize, and what they did. So I believe, Russell, you're up first, right? Yep. So um, this is a relatively newly described tumor. It was only described in 1989 by Hefner. And um, in the cases that he saw, he did 20 cases uh, on uh, post-mortem study, he um, uh, thought they uh, originated in the endolymphatic sac, but he was not sure. In fact, he used the word probable in his title. And later on, as we watched these tumors develop in VHL patients over years, we found that they actually developed from the endolymphatic duct as their source of um, origin. Can you go to the next slide? This is just some of the anatomy. Um, keep uh, Click one more time, Walter, sorry. Just for to orient everybody. Um, here you see the endolymphatic duct uh, within the vestibular aqueduct, the uh, endolymphatic sac, which sits between the two layers of the dura and the anterior cerebellum. And here you see the sigmoid um, and going into the uh, jugular bulb. Uh, next slide. So uh, the goals of treatment, as you mentioned before, and these have evolved over time. And the reason they evolved over time was they were felt to be very benign and we didn't operate on them until they became so big that they involved the brainstem. And in fact, um, it was Hefner that said, you know, we th he thinks the mechanism of the hearing loss is otic capsule destruction. Um, but uh, Ed Oldfield and Tom Mansky um, in 1999 published a paper in JAMA as well, where they showed a bunch of VHL patients, almost 20% at that time, that had endolymphatic sac tumors or hearing loss. And two questions came out of that paper, and they they were officially joined the endolymphatic sac tumor with VHL. But two questions came up: it was it clearly couldn't be otic capsule destruction that was causing hearing loss in these patients because one, they had uh, MR imaging evidence of small endolymphatic sac tumors that did not inv involve the otic capsule, um, and two, a lot of VHL patients had no imaging evidence of an endolymphatic sac tumor yet had hearing loss. And so uh, John Butman, uh, Jeff, myself, John Butman's a neuroradiologist at the uh, NIH that we've worked with for um, now over two decades, uh, began to look at these patients in a kind of a systematic way. We had a prospective natural history study there. And we looked at 35 consecutive VHL patients. They had 38 ELSTs, obviously 9% were bilateral. There's always, for whatever reason, a left-sided predominance that we still can't figure out. It's maybe embryologic or something to those ends, but this is transmitted through a number of series. 
Uh, symptom onset, 31 years of age, which is younger than any other uh, manifestation of VHL. And we had long-term follow-up, almost eight years. Next slide. Sorry. It's okay. Um, they had a, a very classic triad of hearing loss, tinnitus, and vertigo. Many of these patients were diagnosed with Meniere's disease. Um, and this, uh, again, this is very common. It's very rare to see facial nerve paresis, particularly in VHL, because these tumors are tracked so effectively now. Next slide. So what we did was we looked at those 38 years and we took the obvious. If you had OD capsule invasion, those were in seven of the 38 years. Did you have sensory neural hearing loss? No surprise there. Every single one of those patients did just like Hefner would have predicted. What we were most interested in though is, next slide, the ears that did not have otic capsule invasion. Next slide. And that was 31 of the 38 years. And then so we asked the question, well, how many of those 31 years had sensory neural hearing loss? Well, four of them did not. And the other thing we were looking for at the same time was interlabyrinthine hemorrhage because uh, Jeff, myself, and John uh, published a paper um, early 2003 in three cases where we saw intralabyrinthine hemorrhage um, in a patient with sudden hearing loss. And we thought that could be potentially be a mechanism. So we looked on MR imaging in those patients with no hearing loss, did they have any hemorrhage? Didn't, that wasn't the case. In the 27 years that didn't have, did not have otic capsule invasion, but had sensory neural hearing loss, we looked at the time course for the reasons I just mentioned. 14 of those 27 years, um, just over half, had uh, sudden uh, hearing loss. 80% of those patients had evidence of an intralabyrinthine hemorrhage at the time of hearing loss. There was another subset of patients that had gradual hearing loss, and um, again, almost half. None of those years had evidence of intralabyrinthine hemorrhage. So we were beginning to drill down. One, otic capsule invasion clearly is a mechanism uh, for hearing loss. Uh, intralabyrinthine uh, hemorrhage appears to be a mechanism for hearing loss. And um, uh, some other feature must be a, a mechanism for intralabyrinthine uh, or without intralabyrinthine hemorrhage for gradual hearing loss. And in fact, we now, you know, over time and looking at autopsy specimens as well as imaging, uh, came to find that that was probably high drops that gave you that slow. And again, all these fit with these men years like symptoms. Next slide. Um, this just shows that again. Next slide. So uh, what became important, and this goes to a point Scott had earlier, was what we couldn't tell, and this was in contradiction to Ed and Tom Mansky's paper, was it didn't matter what, um, if you had otic capsule invasion, those tumors tended to be bigger. No surprise there. But what surprised us, next slide, was... Uh, not uh, was that, and it's not on this uh, graph, but what was there was no correlation with uh, tumor size and hearing loss. And it, got, it goes back to what Scott said earlier, was these, you're, you're eliminating these, and Walter brought this up, you're eliminating these tumors to prevent a problem because we can't predict the size. Size doesn't have a correlation until it gets so big that they destroy the otic capsule. There's things going on before that. This just documents the statistical difference that intralabyrinthine hemorrhage was associated with sudden hearing loss, not gradual. Next slide. So here were the three mechanisms that we came up with for hearing loss. Direct otic capsule invasion, hemorrhage with sudden hearing loss, and high drops with progressive hearing loss. Those are the three scenarios you can see with VHL patients in lymphatic sac tumors. Next slide. So when it comes to management and um, in VHL, if there's no lymphatic sac tumor on imaging, um, but there's evidence of hearing loss, um, with hemorrhage, interlabyrinthine hemorrhage, or high drops, which we can now scan for. The next slide will show that. We recommend microsurgery, even in the case of an MR invisible ELST. If you see the ELST on imaging and you have hearing present and or audio vestibular symptoms, we recommend microsurgery. If you don't have hearing and you have no vertigo, um, you could potentially observe, and this is where Jeff and I kind of diverted a little bit, I think. Uh, my feeling still is, uh, and Jeff can jump in, you know, is, is to go ahead and remove these tumors to prevent audio vestibular symptoms uh, downstream, tinnitus, fullness, uh, vertigo, potentially. Um, you know, Jeff and I have talked about this over time. I don't think either of us feel there's ever a role for radio surgery or radiation, um, except in post-surgical cases where the tumor is disconnected from the um, otic capsule or interlabyrinthine components. Next slide. And this just shows that now um, we can detect 
high drops in VHL patients. We've operated on four or five of these patients with no imaging evidence of an NELST uh, in VHL and found in small one to two millimeter ELSTs within the vestibular aqueduct. And because we know they originate within the vestibular aqueduct, we target that site anatomically. Um, I think toward the end, when Jeff and I were working together at the NIH with these small tumors, we didn't even remove the endolymphatic uh, sac, didn't find it necessary to uh, potentially increase the risk of a CSF leak. Next slide. And then, now, I'm the backseat driver for Jeff in these cases, unlike Walter and Jeff's <laughs> relationship. And so um, I'm happy to criticize Jeff now because <laughs> he does most of the surgery. Okay, so um, yeah, so I think that in terms of a, a patient with a, uh, intake hearing, it's important for us to intervene earlier because once they have the sudden hearing loss, uh, I don't think that we could actually bring their hearing back. And uh, we have a you know, follow-up of a, up to, I think now probably in some point, 20 years, where we were to do surgery and preserve their hearing. Now, if they do not have any hearing loss and for small tumors, um, I mean, uh, I think that we could do surgery, but also we could kind of follow them as well because it is very slow growing tumor unless it's causing cranial nerve deficit like a facial nerve or uh, it's uh, extending into a sort of pontine angle. But uh, I think that, you know, that area of a patient with a small tumor and uh, no hearing is kind of a, uh, controversial and uh, depends on, um, you know, philosophy of your treatment. Now, um, I thought that Scott did an excellent job going over a case. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is uh, I'm gonna go over the surgical approaches that that we do for endolymphatic sac tumor at NIH. Uh, for a small tumor, especially those with uh, intact hearing, we recommend uh, retrolabinthin posterior pitrosectomy. Uh, as uh, uh, Russ mentioned uh, and Scott mentioned, this tumor centers around the, the posterior uh, um, uh, pitreous bone area. Uh, so this approach is uh, excellent for uh, getting small tumors out. Uh, now, sometimes there's a blind area uh, behind the OTA capsule and uh, an endoscope sometimes can be useful to, to look at that and take the tumor out as well. Large tumors tends to erode into semicircular canals and sometimes a cochlea. Uh, typically they don't have any hearing loss, so we recommend either translabinthin, transotic, or infratemporal fossil approach, depends on the extent of a tumor involvement. Um, if a tumor has extensive a, um, extending to cerebral pontine angle, especially towards the uh, jugular bulb area. Sometimes we could also combine transpetroso and retrosigmoid approach as well. Next, please. Well, Jeff, let, let me ask you this, and, and we forgot to comment about the angiogram. What is the role of embolization here, if any? Uh, you, you know, I think that the, the one of the case that we did for, uh, first time with the Russell and I, uh, we dealt with a really large tumor and uh, it, it, this is very a vascular tumor. Um, I mean, one of the characteristics that we saw was that, that you see a, a blood squirting out through the bone. Um, uh, and so we had a lot of difficulty with, I think, one first, our first large cases. So after that, I think the embolization really helps. And then the other thing I think helps with embolization is to looking at the carotid. Um, you know, sometimes this tumor can actually a, um, I'm not sure that's an invased carotid artery, but it's actually, um, you know, erodes the bony canal along, along the carotid artery. So um, I think it's uh, important to do angiogram. And the other thing is also looking at the status of jugular bulb as well. This tumor tends to- But in, in your embolization patients, have you ever lost the facial nerve function? Uh, no, we have not. Uh, the, the other thing also you have to be careful is that uh, as uh, Scott mentioned earlier, and also was demonstrated in our case that with endolymphatic sac tumor, a lot of times associated with cholesterol granuloma. So some cases when, when in there thinking that it's gonna be a large tumor, uh, but most of them end up being a cholesterol granuloma and then the vascular component of tumor tends to be small. So uh, it's important to look at the imaging studies uh, carefully and you know, make sure you review them with the neuroradiologist and decide whether a patient needs to embolization before the procedure or not. I think, and I would just add, Walter, that's a perfect question because we we don't ever embolize our hemangioblastomas. But in this case, because they are within the bone, you can't use normal bipolar cautery. Basically, you're drilling, then packing, drilling, then packing if you don't embolize. But I think, Jeff, we, less than five of these tumors that have we ever embolized, and those were ones that, you know, were on the order. This is probably the smallest of them that I think we probably ever embolized, but it's useful 
because of the bone component that the tumor is growing through. Uh, so um, the other thing that you have to be aware about uh, endolymphatic tumor, especially if you're dealing with the von and Dow disease, is that the bilateral case can occur up to 30%. So if a patient has a profound sensory neural hearing loss, and especially bilateral, you need to be, a, a be concerned about whether the patient need, can get benefit from cochlear implantation uh, later on or at the time of surgery. Uh, in fact, we had a one patient where we did a resected tumor and then place a cochlear implant and she had a good result. So when we do surgery, we try to preserve a cochlear nerve and do a OD capsule as much as we can. Next slide, please. Uh, when we are doing uh, surgery, we typically place a patient in supine position with a shoulder roll placed. Uh, we make a standard postricular incision uh, and we use intraoperative facial neural monitoring for all the cases. And if a patient, if a tumor is uh, abutting the a, um, a lower cranial nerve, we also do laryngeal monitoring. If a patient has uh, intact hearing or uh, serviceable hearing, we also do ABM monitoring as well. And we already talked about it already for a larger tumor, especially they're abutting the uh, carotid canal. We also will get uh, preoperative uh, angiogram and embolization as necessary. So on this slide, uh, uh, Russell is gonna go over um, um, how we took out this one lymphatic sac tumor through retrolabinth and- Yeah, yeah so this it. actually isn't the case of the patient that we talked about, Jeff will get to that. Um, this is just a retrolabinth posterior petrosectomy. We've, uh, Jeff's removed the vestibular aqueduct. There you see the endolymphatic sac duct and here you can see it there. So it's a very small structure on the order of about a millimeter. In this case, this tumor is very small, like the vast majority that we've removed, sits within the duct. Um, and here you can see you're splitting, the, the dura is opened. Uh, you can see the tumor within that, and that can be delivered directly out um, through the vestibular aqueduct that's been removed posteriorly, superiorly. And then that's drilling into the vestibular aqueduct, and we just generally will place bone wax um, or something over that to seal that. And patients will typically have a small conductive hearing loss for a, a period of several weeks to uh, months afterwards that resolves on its own. So that's the vast majority of cases are these very small tumors. Um, and Jeff's gonna talk uh, directly about this case that um, well, was shown earlier. Next slide. So uh, returning to uh, our case, uh, this, this is a schematic drawing of a uh, left ear, you know, although in our case it was a right ear, but if you look at the shaded area, you could tell the extensive tumor in our case. It basically extended up to the carotid canal, involved jugular valve area, and it rolled into a semicircular canal. So what we did was that we did made a standard extended postauricular incision. We extend our incision toward the upper neck area in case we need to get vascular control in the neck uh, during the case. We also dissected a greater auricular nerve in case we need a cable graft for facial nerve uh, reconstruction as well. Um, and uh, we um, initially closed the ear canal after making post-auricular incision. We go, to, can you go to the next slide, please? So wait, 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 a couple of details there. What, what kind of vascular control are you getting at the neck? Uh, we actually, we tried to identify the uh, carotid and jugular bulb in case uh, uh, we need to um, uh, control the, uh, the carotid artery, especially in this case. The preoperative angiogram did show that uh, the jugular bulb is rhombosed here. Uh, so okay. uh, just in case uh, we, we did it, but we didn't, in this case, we actually did not expose it, but we did make the, uh, we prepped the area and then uh, we did extend the uh, incision so that just in case we need to get the vascular control that we're able to uh, control the bleeding. So, and you close the ear canal? Uh, yes, we did close the ear canal first. Yeah. yeah, so Walter, we didn't do a open kind of exposure of the carotid prior to that. It was just a veil, we prepped, that area was just prepped. Just right, okay. So uh, if you start the video here, um, <clears throat> you can see the hypervascular mass, mass uh, uh, through the, uh, the middle ear space. After we perform the cortical mastectomy, you could see the, the tumor extruding through the the posterior petrous bone. We delineated the uh, digastric ridge and the vertical segment of a facial nerve. Uh, um, and then we drilled out the, the horizontal and posterior semicircular canal. That was uh, um, a by tumor. We also 
uh, removed some of a uh, cochlea that was also involved by tumor as well. Uh, and, uh, and we're working around the, uh, the bony fallopian uh, bridges that we created. And you could see that tumor has exposed carotid artery, but not embedding into carotid artery. Uh, at this point, we open up the retrofacial uh, air cells uh, to get access to the jugular bulb area and the hypotympanum. Uh, we are bipolaring tumor to shrink it down and debulk it, as you can see here. And then now we're actually taking the uh, tumor, uh, uh, peeling it off from the facial nerve epineurium. Um, we were 100% sure we got uh, all the tumor out. Uh, and then at the end, we basically are um, removing the remaining tumor from the jugular bulb and sigmoid sinus uh, uh, junction. And uh, uh, you will see that we're uh, encounter some brisk bleeding there from probably from that junction area. Um, since uh, the embolization showed that jugular bulb was uh, thrombosed, we decided to ligate the, the uh, sigmoid sinus at this point for uh, hemostasis. Uh, and then um, you can see that Russell has a nice job uh, getting hemostasis with a job form and the uh, uh, pledged. So, then, so this tumor invaded into the sinus. There was no way that you can preserve the sinus integrity. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, and then you know, we open up the uh, dura anterior to sigmoid sinus, and we are now peeling off the tumor from the uh, posterior fossa dura, uh, and then continue to, um, to remove the remaining uh, tumor. Um, so, you know, especially the larger tumor tend to get really stuck to the uh, sigmoid sinus area and a jugular bulb area. Uh, so when you are exposing this area, it's important to you know remove, I guess, I mean, remove the mastoid tip and tympanic bone to really uh, identify the jugular bulb really well. And then um, at this point, we are checking to make sure that uh, the gross tumors are removed, hemostasis uh, established, and then we typically fill the mastoid cavity and middle ear space with the uh, abdominal fat. Uh, obliterate the eustachian tube orifice, and then and close the post-regular incision uh, in multiple layers. Uh, next, what point. is the role, if any, of a partial resection? You got you got this invading very close to the carotid. You got it invading into the the venous sinuses. Is there a role of partial resection in wait and see, or are these so locally aggressive that you have to be this aggressive? Uh, I, I think that we tried to remove as much as we can, but in our series, I mean, we did have a uh, three cases that we weren't able to take the tumor out. Um, you know, like two cases, it was very close to carotid artery, and we weren't uh, we weren't comfortable taking the tumor uh, from the carotid canal. And then the other case that you know sometimes it's actually uh, invade into internal auditory canal, uh, especially in facial uh, patient has an intake facial nerve function. And when tumor is in internal auditory canal, it's very tough to uh, peel off the tumor from the, the facial nerve internal auditory canal. I mean, it's not uh, acoustic neuroma where you have a good separation of the tumor and the facial nerve in many cases. So this is our post-op uh, um, images uh, um, you know, that we, uh, you could see on pre and post contra MRI scan. Uh, showed no obvious uh, a, a gross tumor. You see the fat graft in mastoid cavity. And then on the right side, you could see the, um, the CT scan of temporal bone uh, after uh, we drilled out the uh, order capsules and the placement of a fat graft. Next, please. So uh, next slide. So we uh, reviewed our uh, series uh, at NIH uh, when the Russell was there. Um, you know, this is a, a, a endolymphatic sac tumor um, in von Hippel endowed disease. Uh, but maybe perhaps Dr. Sana can uh, uh, um, tell us about uh, his experience in non von Hippel endowed disease patients. But in our case, there were 33 years in 31 consecutive, consecutive patients with a VHL, and the tumor range, tumor size range from 0.2 to 5.2 uh, centimeters. And 70% uh, of uh, cases are done through retro labyrinthine an approach for uh, mostly small tumors. And the four larger tumors, uh, we uh, uh, use to either translab, transotic, or infratemporal fossil approach as a, a, uh, a fit. Um, 
And then and earlier, we also did some retro sigmoid approach as well. We're able to uh, uh, com do the complete resection in uh, over 90% of cases, but we did have a, uh, three cases where we had to leave two more behind. And then we had the one recurrence of our own series where to reoperate. And then uh, out of the 22 years with the measurable hearing, 70% uh, had a stable hearing, and then 14% uh, had to improve hearing, and then 14% also had a, uh, uh, immediate and delayed hearing loss as well. Of those people with the digit symptoms, their symptoms improved in 86% of, of time. And uh, we did have uh, four cases with the preoperative facial nerve, a, um, uh, facial nerve weakness. Uh, they had a house fragment of uh, two, two, uh, and um, three, and five. And uh, those people with the house fragment of uh, two, two, and three, I'm sorry, four, I'm sorry, uh, has improved uh, after surgery, but one with the uh, house fragment of five did not uh, improve after surgery. Uh, so in right. summary, I think that uh, endolymphatic sac tumor can be surgically treated, and it is a, a, um, a good option to preserve uh, auditory function uh, and control the uh, uh, dizziness. All righty. Um, wow, thank you for that. Uh, you guys have a very uh, impressive series of um, hippo uh patients, and uh, thank you for showing us how you did all that. So we are now uh, have the great honor of turning the podium over to Professor Sana, and um, Professor Sana can educate us about his experience uh, with this uh, entity. Professor Sana, please share your screen. Good morning. Good, Good morning. morning, everybody. Thank you very much for the invitation. Very interesting talks. Uh, I have a, a comment on the second case. I think it has been done a mistake pre-op. You did not do angio MRI for the sinuses. Uh, examine if the jugular bulb and sigmoid sinus homolatera could be closed because there is the risk of a lot of bleeding if you don't up, uh, close the jugular vein in the neck and the sigmoid sinus extra luminal because I saw that you left tumor behind and it is not worthwhile to let to leave the tumors in that case. So you did correctly magnetic resonance imaging, CAT scan for bone windows, uh, angio MRI that showed that was a, a blush, a flash the uh, rapid blush, which demonstrate that is a very vascularizing tumor, so that uh, considered an embolization, but you did not examine the sigmoid sinus and the jugular bulb. Because very often, when you open the uh, always when you open the bulb, there is bleeding that is uncontrollable, unless you close with the surgeon and you left the tumor behind. It should be better to the magnetic resonance imaging first, then if the exam uh, demonstrate that the torcular was present and intact, the controllator was perfectly functioning, that you have to prepare the approach through the neck, identifying the jugular vein, just the anterior to the lateral process of the atlas, and then putting a, a suture without closing. Then you go to operate, uh, and the surgery is almost correct, but you did not remove sufficiently bone in the anterior wall of the external auditory canal. And you did not control the anterior part of the middle ear in order to see the vertical portion of the carotid. Because if you remove the tumor from the carotid, and by chance, there is a, a small vessel from the carotid to the tumor, you do not control. So. One is pre-operatively, I think is a mistake, not having done magnetic resonance imaging and gemaran for the jugular bulb. Second, surgically, you did not prepare the jugular vein in the neck. It's a just simple opening, just middle or inferiorly to the mastoid tip, uh, touching with the, with the finger, the lateral process of the atlas, and you identify, identify immediately the jugular vein. Then you go to operate. You have to unclose and uncover <clears throat> much more the sigmoid sinus and falling the sigmoid sinus down to the jugular bulb, leaving there, 
then removing anteriorly a lot of bone of the anterior wall of the external auditory canal. In doing so, you control either posteriorly and inferiorly, sigmoid, jugular bulb, and jugular vein, and anteriorly, the vertical portion of carotid. And then you control also the acute angle that there is between the vertical portion of carotid and the anterior wall of the jugular, uh, jugular bulb. In doing so, you can prevent well, yeah, so, Professor, Sano, those, those are excellent points. Let, let, let's let, let get them. Let's get their reaction. Uh, Dr. Kims and, and Monzer, did, did you consider this? Uh, did you consider being more aggressive than you were? Did you have did you think that your angiogram gave you sufficient information? What are you what is your reaction to what Professor Sana just said? I can speak to that and Jeff can as well. We do have MRA, MRV on all these patients. So okay. uh, and as you know, there's a duplication is the dura is the dura from the uh, anterior posterior um, com, uh, fossa comes over to the jugular bulb, you, the duplication. We've used that to our advantage in a number of cases to separate that. Uh, saying that, this entered into the jugular bulb, but I've never, from the jugular bulb component, like Jeff was saying, we prep for the carotid. Yet you can, as you know, you can control that if need be by backing, even in that horizontal segment. And I've not had problems with stopping jugular or venous sinus bleeding uh, from this approach by just simple direct compression at the end of the day, which we did. And in fact, we, we removed the entirety of the tumor by cutting that out. You saw me cutting that out of the jugular um, ball wall. So I don't, I have not had that experience to be honest with you. Um, we've been able to control it with just simple compression. Um, we've had to, you know, and not just ELSTs, but other cases. Um, but saying that do very much appreciate the, the need for the MRA, MRV, angio, which were done before. Okay. All right. But he, he, you. Work, he work in the ocean of blood. <laughs> so that instead of working in the, because one of the <laughs> principles of the skull base is a bloodless technique, first of all. So because you have to control everything without blood. If you had control yeah. the sigmoid sinus, we close the sigmoid sinus laterally, not intradural, extradural, and yes. eventually close the jugular vein, then you can remove the lateral wall of the jugular bulb, controlling everything, leaving the medial wall of the jugular bulb. In doing so, you, you preserve the lower cranial yes. nerve. And I agree. You, you work it with the blood, with the blood, with a lot of blood. That is incorrect, I think. Yeah. And, and then I, you I, did not control the vertical portion of the carotid. I didn't see it in your operation. We had that the vertical it, portion of the carotid is completely out of the field. Yeah. So to the point of the, I don't think it was uncontrolled. I think we had probably five millimeters. And to your point, I 100% agree. Two things we do in that scenario, if in that one, I always leave and Jeff, we always leave the arachnoid intact. So blood does not transmit ever into the posterior fossa. In these cases, as we get over the ball where there's duplication of the anterior posterior fossa dura and the uh, uh, dura and lining over the bulb, we'll lift that and leave it intact. And that you can see, so that we don't transmit blood into the CSF. I agree 100% with you. Um, and I don't think we had a sea of blood. I mean, it didn't even go five millimeters. The facial nerve was five millimeters away and we never got it above the facial nerve if you watch that video. Uh, Dr. Zana, thanks for your comment. Um, I think you're absolutely correct. Uh, but what we did was that we did get a uh, preoperative uh, arterial venous angiogram. And we actually knew that uh, jugular bulb was a thrombosed. And uh, uh, when we encountered the bleeding, uh, we, we felt that bleeding was either coming from the sigmoid sinus side or infratemporal, uh, an inferior pitual sinus area. So we did ligate the sigmoid sinus extradurally. We made an incision uh, um, anterior and posterior sigmoid sinus. Uh, we did um, the ligated sigmoid sinus extradurally. Now, for the neck incision, we did expose it up to sternocleidal mastoid uh, muscle, uh, but we didn't put a vascular loop around the vessel. And then in terms of carotid, uh, based on a CT scan, uh, we did not think that um, it, it was involving in carotid, but in case it, it were to, we were, it, we were prepared to drill more anteriorly to expose the vertical uh, segment of a uh, carotid artery. So, I mean, I think your comment is, I think is, uh, um, uh, is excellent, uh, but we do try to also uh, um, the manage the vascular uh, issue during the procedure. You're right. I think that in the skull base, I mean, I think you're going to have less complications if you're able to control 
uh, the blood vessels and you know you don't have too much bleeding issue during the procedure. Thanks for your comment. Yeah, th this is this is by the way webinar gold here. And as a producer of this series, this is what I want. We are allowed to disagree respectfully on, on this webinar, and that's what makes it interesting, right? It, it, you know, not everybody does the, the same way. And Professor Sano obviously has vast experience in this, and and uh, th this is you know. The disagreement is uh, is what makes uh, is interesting, and everybody has somewhat of a personal style. So, thank you for those comments, Professor Sana. Do you do you, uh, what What else would you like to share with us? As a principle of the lateral skull base, we have to remember one thing: remove the bone and leave the brain alone, and then control all the structures and surrounding areas. I saw that the approach is, was too narrow, too bloody. And then it means that if you follow this principle, then you will not have, generally speaking, any problem in controlling the bleeding, controlling the vessel, controlling the vital structures. So remove the bone and leave the brain alone and controlling your enemy, all surroundings. As a principle of the war, or the Mongols, that they control everything around. So that if you do not know you're an enemy, you'll be defeated so sooner or later. Uh, Dr. Ravi Sami, uh, you're the boss of our hot seater. And uh, any uh, pearls of wisdom, at, at least you can critique what uh, your fellow, um, how, how your fellow performed today. Hey, uh, good, good morning. Can you hear me, Walter? Yes. Well, appreciate uh, Scott being on there, and uh, thank you, Professor Sana and, and the rest of the group. And Scott's got oral boards coming up, Walter, very shortly in about two weeks. And I said to him, this is great preparation for that. This was not an easy case. And so kudos to you for picking a great uh, group of panelists and uh, a case. Wonderful. And by the way, for the audience who, who don't who doesn't know who don't know, uh, Professor Sami, of course, is uh, uh, the um, professor of otology uh, in uh, University of Cincinnati. And uh, thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you. Um, all right. So uh, that was a very exciting episode of, of this webinar. Thank you for all the panelists. And you know, again, uh, the the. The webinar quality is driven by the cases that our panelists bring to us. So I'm very indebted to Drs. Kim and Lonser for bringing such an uh, unusual case and unusual topic to us. Uh, Scott, great job. Uh, you can relax. Uh, fantastic uh, um, uh, job on the hot seat. And I understand that uh, you know we have a giant of the of the skull base world uh, with us today, Professor Sana. So thank you, thank you for your time you and uh, your suggestion, your suggestions of the. Uh, and we will have you back for the Glomus uh, uh, episode whenever we schedule that in, in the near future. So uh, a, a word about the next episode now. Um, we are going to be back to you in two weeks uh, with an episode, uh, cases coming out of MD Anderson Cancer Center in Texas, and our discussant will be uh, Dan Fliss from Israel. So yet another international episode. For now, uh, thank you, uh, Scott. Thank you, uh, Jeff and Russell, and uh, a profuse thanks to Professor Sana for being our honored guest. Uh, Surgeon's Log 2021 signs off now, and uh, everybody have a good rest of the day.